Hello, everyone. Good morning and uh, and welcome back. We are going to uh, now reconvene uh, with our symposium on the America Invents Act. <clears throat> we have a, a really special treat uh, for, for everyone today, um, a fireside chat with uh, Judge Raymond Chin. Uh, Angela, I know that you, you told me not to give you a long introduction, but we have had several people join since the, the first panel. So I'll, I'll just briefly uh, introduce you and then turn it over to you. So our moderator for uh, this panel today is Angela Oliver. Uh, she's an associate at Haynes and Boone. Uh, her practice focuses on appeals before the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, Federal District Court litigation, and post-grant proceedings before the US Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, Angela is a graduate of the SMU Dedman School of Law. Uh, and before uh, entering into practice, uh, she served as a law clerk to Chief Judge Prost of the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and uh, to now Chief Judge Rodney Gilstrap of the US District Court for the Eastern District of Texas. And so with that, Angela, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you so much. Well, now I have the uh, pleasure of introducing our guest today, um, Judge Chen of the US Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Judge Chen was appointed to the bench by President Obama in 2013 and assumed office later that year. Prior to his service on the federal circuit, Judge Chen served in various roles at the US Patent and Trademark Office for many years, including as Deputy General Counsel for Intellectual Property Law and Solicitor from 2008 to 2013. Earlier in his career, he also served as a technical assistant at the Federal Circuit. And before joining the court staff, Judge Chen was an associate with Kenobi Martins, Olson and Bear. And prior to law school, he worked as a scientist at the law firm of Heckler and Harriman from 1989 to 1991. Judge Chen received his JD from the New York University School of Law in 1994 and his BS in electrical engineering from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1990. Judge Chen, we are so glad to have you here with us today. Thanks, Angela. Uh, glad to be here. And uh, hello to uh, the SMU community and, and Texas. So before we begin, I'll just note for the audience that we will have a Q&A session toward the end of our time together. So if you think of a question during our presentation, feel free to send it in through the Q&A feature, and we'll take a look and try to get to those at the end of this presentation. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So Judge Chen, given that we are here today virtually, which is a bit unusual, let me just begin by asking, how have you been doing during the pandemic? Um, I've been okay. We've, I've been muddling through. I think the court's been doing fine. Um, uh, I've gotten to know my dog really well because I'm working from home all the time and uh, I think we're okay. So speaking of the court, then what has changed about your work at the court during the pandemic and what has stayed the same? Yeah, um, well, you can see my background is courtroom 201 of the federal circuit, but I have not been inside that courtroom in about a year now. And we are doing all of our oral arguments by telephone. I know a lot of courts are doing video conferencing, um, Zoom conferencing and things like that. But so far we've elected to do our hearings uh, solely by uh, telephone. And so there that that's one thing. And then um, another thing is, you know, I haven't seen a lot of my colleagues in about a year, which is strange. And but probably the biggest difference is the clerk uh, judge experience in terms of working together. Um, I'm working from home, they're working from their apartments in DC and we can't really see each other or we rarely do, which means we have to communicate by phone and text and email and things like that. Yeah, I bet that is quite a bit different of an experience. Um, going to the, the oral argument point, um, how have the telephone arguments been going? Is that been working well for the court? Um, I think it's been working well enough. It, it gets the job done, but I would also say that it's not optimal. It's it's better, maybe even far better to be in person where the lawyer can see me and I can see the lawyer. And uh, I think we can have a better conversation and we don't misunderstand each other as much. Um, so 
you know, I, I don't think any of us had anticipated that we would be doing telephone arguments this long. And so we thought we could just skate by with a few months of telephone arguments, but now it's gotten to about a year. And if we had known that we were going to be like this for a full year, maybe we would have tried to move to video conferencing at some point uh, along the way. Sure, it's the whole you know pandemic has lasted quite a bit longer than I think everyone originally anticipated. Um, but since this seems to be continuing for a bit longer, at least with respect to telephone arguments, is there anything that practitioners can do to improve the experience for the court? Um, things, you know, do's and don'ts that we could make it easier? Um, I think by and large, lawyers are doing well under the circumstances. We understand that it's hard for them um, is to get their point across. And so as, as the judges, as the audience, we, we recognize that and want to be patient uh, about that and take that into consideration at the same time you know, if I was to make a, a broad generality, um, there there are some times where you you wonder as as a judge whether uh, lawyers occasionally are are maybe not taking the phone hearing as seriously as they would if mm -hmm. they were to fly to D.C., stay in a hotel, and then walk into courtroom two hundred one and be in the arena with three judges staring down at them. And so I, I, I do think it's important to take it as seriously as if you were in person and make sure you do a moot court and you do have a great set of moot court judges thoroughly testing you on all of your hardest points, your weakest points to make sure that you're as prepared as you can be, uh, especially with great familiarity with the joint appendix and all of the relevant case law at your fingertips. It's going to come up at the phone argument. You need to have all that uh, right there in front of you and be ready to respond. I think that's great advice uh, for practitioners, um, both with telephonic arguments and going forward um, in regular arguments as well. So Judge Chen, you've served on the federal circuit since 2013. But prior to that, um, you held various positions at the patent office, including as solicitor, um, and you spent some time in private practice as well. So for our audience today, would you just tell us a little bit about your career journey and you know what steered you toward patent law? Sure. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a humble story in the sense that um, the, the reason why I went into patent law was to escape from electrical engineering. Uh, I was... Uh, basically ordered by my family to either be an engineer or a doctor. And if I was going to be an engineer, then be an electrical engineer. So because I didn't want to be a doctor, I ended up majoring in electrical engineering. And that was fine for the first two years. But then because I wasn't really paying attention in those first set of classes, uh, the third year, I just got rocked by those upper division double E classes. And then I realized at the end of my third year, um, I don't really like this very much, the, the, the intensity of electrical engineering, and I'm not even good at it. So what am I doing here? Uh, and then I got very lucky through a friend of a friend of a friend. Literally, it was that chain of uh, people. I eventually met some patent lawyers, and they told me what patent law was about. And uh, they were young patent lawyers with a small boutique in LA. And they took a chance on me to uh, give me a part-time job during my senior year at college. And uh, it worked out and it gave me some window into thinking there's another world, there's something I can do with an electrical engineering degree uh, that goes beyond just doing the hardcore engineering work. And it was, it was, um, reading about, thinking about, and writing about technology on a level that I could handle compared to the more hardcore level that you get in your double E classes. That's how I started in patent law. <laughs> 
Wow. So that, that's a great story. And you've had such a, a, a long and distinguished career in patent law since then, um, including kind of during this transition period with the America Invents Act, which, of course, is the topic of the day uh, for today's symposium. So, of course, the AIA was signed into law in September of 2011. Um, and it's widely, widely considered the most sweeping reform to the patent system since at least the Patent Act of 1952. So from your perspective, what are the biggest changes just generally that the AIA has introduced to patent law? Well, um, it, it has to be these um, post-grant cancellation proceedings, these um, new patent board cancellation proceedings. That's, that is, from my vantage point uh, where I sit, uh, it's changed the, the composition of the work of the federal circuit because we get so many appeals from those kinds of proceedings, particularly IPRs. And, um, you know, never before have patents, granted patents been uh, tested on this scale on this uh, this level of magnitude and it's it's interesting to see what the outcomes have been so far and and so we've been seeing a lot of that through our federal circuit appeals uh, an interesting thing is also the the pto's budget has changed quite a bit because through the aia the patent office got fee setting authority now maybe because i'm a former pto insider i that's something I appreciate more than the regular patent lawyer out there in the country. But, uh, you know, the PTO's budget today is three times bigger than it was 10 years ago. And it's because of fee setting authority. It's because of its ability to hold on to and retain its fees. And uh, it's allowed the agency to do a lot more things than it could before uh, when it was hampered in the, say, the 80s, 90s and so on with uh and and so they've at least reduced pendency which is which is a really great thing for the patent office and then there's a new section 102 uh i understand which we haven't really seen yet over where i am but one day i'm going to have to learn that new section 102 and every time i look at it it looks very scary and if i was in law school right now i, I don't even know what professors do do they teach the old 102 and the, the new 102 I mean, if I, think so. was, if I was a law student doing that, that would probably break my brain trying to remember the new 102 and the old 102. But I guess if you're going to be a functioning patent lawyer right now, you need to know both. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that's happening with the patent bar, too. You know, um, people taking the patent bar are expected to learn both and be able to apply both. So it's, yeah. you know, still a transition period. So you mentioned, you know, your unique perspective, especially about the fee shifting, um, having that unique perspective from the patent office. So you've you've kind of seen the AIA a little bit from both sides, from the patent office and, of course, now at the court. Um, so let's speak for a minute just about your experience at the patent office. Um, mm -hmm. For many years prior to the enactment of the AIA, Congress had been experimenting with various versions of similar bills. Uh, what role, if any, did the Patent Office play in shaping the policies that Congress considered along the way? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's important to understand the distinction between lobbying and technical assistance. And what the PTO provided was technical assistance. It did not do lobbying. So that, that's at least officially. Um, but I, I think the PTO was pretty important in the shaping of the AIA, particularly with, for example, these uh, new patent board uh, cancellation proceedings, um, the, you know, teaching Congress and con congressional staffers about uh, how to set up the framework and how to avoid um, uh, difficult uh, problems. Uh, at the same time, obviously, looking back 10 years later, there were problems in the final version that probably could have been corrected uh, at the time. But in, there was a lot of assistance there. There was um, advice on the new 102. I know we were trying to harmonize our patent system to a certain degree with other countries, uh, although it didn't quite get all the way there with the first to file. But there was a version of that. And then things with, again, getting back to the PTO budget, 
third party submissions. So much of the AIA is PTO centric. So I, I think it's fair to say the PTO's fingerprints are uh, on, on that act quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one other change that the AIA brought about with respect to the Patent Office was the establishment of the PTO's regional offices, um, which resulted in the establishment of offices in Detroit and Denver and Dallas and Silicon Valley. Um, certainly SMU Law School and Dallas itself has benefited from having the PTO just a stone's throw away. Um, and in fact, we'll hear from Hope Shmabuku, the regional director of that office later today. But from your view in the solicitor's office at the patent office, how did the PTO's expansion uh, to this nationwide presence um, impact the PTO? Yeah, um, I think from what I recall, the one of the big goals of these regional offices was to be able to draw on talent that was available in other parts of the country that maybe weren't so interested or it wasn't so convenient for them to move to the Washington DC area. So, uh, you know, that's why in large part those areas, those particular regions and, and towns were selected was to get access to uh, a great deal more talent uh, for the agency. Uh, another great thing about these regional offices is I really can see that it has improved outreach in terms of um, really informing the public in those particular areas about the patent system and the importance of innovation and then protecting your innovation in, in terms of starting up companies and, and things like that. And, and hopefully um, just getting people more excited about uh, investing in research and development and then innovating, whether you're a, uh, a medium-sized company or an individual person working out of your garage. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it. I think it also has um, had the effect of increasing outreach. I think there's just a much bigger awareness of what the patent office does um, nationwide now. So another major change uh, brought about from the AIA, of course, was the creation of these different types of post grant proceedings. So we have inter partes review, like you've already discussed a bit, post grant review, uh, and covered business method review. So uh, before we shift your perspective from the federal circuit. One last question from the patent office perspective. How did the creation of these new types of proceedings affect your work in the solicitor's office at the PTO? And perhaps describe the role of the solicitor as well, just uh, for our students here. Sure. Uh, the solicitor's office is, um, it's like a litigation shop for the PTO. It, they are the, the defenders of the PTO in federal court when it comes to any patent or trademark related matter. There's another um, set of lawyers in the PTO that handle um, you know, contract disputes or HR disputes and, and things like of that nature. But when it comes to patents and trademarks, when it comes to defending the patent board and trademark board decisions at the federal circuit, this is where the solicitor's office steps in and we or not we, but they now come to places like courtroom 201 where they stand behind that lectern and explain to the best they can why patent board and trademark board decisions should be affirmed. Same thing is uh, any challenges under the APA to regulations, examination guidelines, things like that. Another important thing is the solicitor's office's relationship with the Justice Department particularly the Solicitor General when it comes to uh, Supreme Court matters in which uh, the uh, intellectual property law is at stake. So when I was the solicitor, that meant all of those Section 101 cases, Bilski, Mayo, Myriad, um, Microsoft versus I4I was a blockbuster. That was all about whether the clear and convincing evidence standard uh, the burden of proof for invalidating a patent should stand or should be struck down. So um, the, P the solicitor's office is the agency's representative uh, to advise and advocate really on behalf of the agency and the patent system for why uh, the solicitor general's office should take a certain position to push to the Supreme Court. Uh, there's a few other things that the solicitor's office does, but. Um, 
those are some important ones. And then as to your question about what has the AIA done uh, with the Slitzer's office, um, the, the AIA didn't really get going until after I had left and joined the court. But as you can see, um, the bulk of patent related cases that the Supreme Court has been hearing for the past seven, eight years have all been about the AIA. And Quozo, Oil States, SAS, Thrive. I think next week is Arthrex, the constitutionality of administrative patent judges. So the Supreme Court's taken a real interest in a lot of different aspects of the AIA and the solicitor's office has had to work very, very, very closely with the Solicitor General's office uh, in developing positions and defending the agency's views on what is the right way to think about all these different aspects of the AIA. So um, I didn't get that piece of the fun necessarily because I had already come over here. Uh, the spin cycle of fun that I got for better or for worse related to section 101. I think that sounds like a lot of fun. I, I can't imagine being at the PTO at that time. That would have been really interesting. So let's th let's then shift uh, to your your current perspective, which is you know the view of the AIA kind of from the federal circuit. Um, now that you've been on the bench for quite a few years now, um, from your perspective, has the AIA changed how patents are litigated in district court? Uh, yes, in the sense that there are fewer being litigated in the district court. And uh, that's because district courts are not unreasonably choosing to stay a lot of litigations to await the outcome of an IPR over at the patent board, given that um, it very, very well may be that the claims get canceled at the patent board. And so then there would be no need for a judge, a jury, a court to uh, invest all kinds of resources in, in litigating a patent. At, given that it's a relatively short amount of time that one of these uh, patent board proceedings takes. So there have been fewer, there have been more stays. Um, and, and that means there are more, it, it feels like there are fewer jury trials because we don't get as many appeals from jury verdicts as say we did five, six years ago when I first was here as a brand new judge. So the, the character of um, appeals from the district court, it seems to have gone down uh, in terms of just raw numbers, as well as um, at, probably section 101 has a lot to do with it too, because we're, we're seeing a lot of rule 12 dismissals more than before. I see. That's very interesting. So you, you mentioned the, the fact that district courts fairly um, often have stayed uh, cases pending IPR, but how often does the court see cases that directly address the interplay between district court cases that continue and AIA trials, you know, whether that be through issues involving estoppel or the timing of litigation or something else? Yeah, it, it comes up from time to time. I mean, there are questions of issue preclusion, something that's been finally resolved in, in one of the parallel proceedings and whether that uh, final resolution of that issue should apply and carry over to the other proceeding. Um, obviously, you know, if, if a patent gets canceled, uh, we've been mooting out a lot of appeals from district court cases. Um, the same thing if a district court uh, invalidity decision goes all the way to final here at the federal circuit. Likewise, um, patent board proceedings get mooted. Uh, one of the uncomfortable um, interactions as, with these parallel proceedings has been when a district court and a patent board uh, arrive at different claim constructions for the exact same disputed term in their respective proceedings and then we at the Federal Circuit are placed in this uncomfortable position of possibly concluding that both constructions are right under the different applicable 
uh, claim construction rubrics that they apply in the sense that, well, perhaps the district court was correct under a Markman standard uh, at arriving at what's really the most correct and, and accurate construction in light of all the intrinsic evidence. And yet at the same time, the patent board was perhaps also reasonable to read that claim term a bit more broadly than the district court had. And then you get to this uh, peculiar situation where um, you, as a, as a judge, you worry that a claim term is getting twisted like a nose of wax in the sense that it can mean two different things in two different proceedings. And what are the consequences of that? I think the patent board is doing something that's going to help alleviate that problem now that they've shifted over from the broadest reason interpretation standard to the so-called marking standard. And then ideally and hopefully we will be able to um, have avoid these inconsistent kind of results. And maybe in fact, uh, you'll see more bases for issue preclusion in fact, uh, now that the claim construction standards are the same. Yeah, so let's talk about claim construction then for a minute. So another difference kind of between the two tribunals is in district court, you typically have a full-blown Markman proceeding. So you have briefing, you often have expert testimony, you have a Markman hearing that's solely focused on construction of the terms. And that all happens long before you go to trial. And so typically by the time of trial, the parties are well aware of how the terms will be construed. Um, at the board, that's a little different. Claim construction is kind of happening alongside the rest of what's going on. And sometimes you may not know the final construction until the final written decision. So, you know, given those procedural differences, the, the federal circuit obviously hears many claim construction disputes from both tribunals. Um, do those procedural differences make any difference or, or affect how the federal circuit um, analyzes those issues? Um, I, I don't think it, it has that much of an impact. I mean, I can understand from a litigator's point of view, um, say the patent board way of doing things is a little harder. You, you really have to have your head on a swivel to anticipate potential different outcomes of how the construction will land and then what your arguments are uh, under each of those possibilities. But once you get to the federal circuit, now we're just trying to look at the construction that the board or the district court finally arrived at. And so from our uh, perspective, it's just a matter of, did they get it right? Um, and you know, oftentimes I, I just read the patent myself and say, okay, I see all this briefing and I know which cases both sides are going to be citing for their preferred outcome. I'm just gonna read this patent and try to get to the bottom of it and see if I can figure it out and then see to what degree that matches up with what the lower tribunal uh, came to. But um, the, the one problem with the patent board way of doing it is there is, um, there is a possibility, a, a threat of of the board reaching a construction that no party had would have anticipated. And so then you get into a due process concern that now the board is uh, arriving at a construction nobody anticipated and then immediately applying it in a final written decision, giving no party really any opportunity to respond to that brand new construction and try to explain to the board why, even if that construction is correct, why they should still prevail. So um, we've written about that in a few uh, opinions here at the Federal Circuit, letting the board know that you know, they need to be careful and wary and cognizant of that possibility. And, and so you know, I would think you know, if I was a patent board judge and I was really convinced that a construction um, that no party had advocated for I would issue a, an order saying, this is the claim construction. Now I need supplemental briefing under this construction before reaching a final written decision. I know sometimes the patent board is very, very, very sensitive to completing everything within 12 months, but they do have um, you know, an escape hatch of, under the statute of being able to extend that time out. I'm not sure they've ever used that um, 
safety valve before, but there, I think there are plenty of circumstances where it warrants it. Sure, that's a great point, just as a reminder about that, that safety valve, as you call it. Um, yeah, I don't think it's been used uh, at all, if, if maybe once or twice, but I'm not sure it's been used at all. Um, so another thing that you mentioned um, was the way that the AIA has changed the, the court's caseload. And, um, you know, I've seen even in some circumstances, the federal circuit will hear four IPR appeals in one day, uh, which seems like a lot. Um, but how, from your perspective, do these IPR appeals differ from the district court appeals that you see? Um, well, if we were just to speak about apples to apples in terms of validity determinations that we see at the district court and, and then at the patent board, you know, um, I would say we're, we're seeing quality work from both tribunals. We're seeing some, you know, careful, um, well thought out opinions and providing um, a lot of reasoning and a lot of exploration of the evidence. Um, but if I, if I were to say that there's a slight tendency of one tribunal over another, I would probably say the patent board um, maybe devotes itself a little more in, uh, with the nitty gritty <clears throat> of the prior art references that it's working with. Um, and the district courts, <clears throat> they might be a little more comfortable talking about the case law that's relevant. You know, the principles of whether a reference teaches away or the principles of secondary consideration evidence. And, um, and so maybe that's a, a slight distinction you would see uh, on the margins between the two tribunals. Uh, I would also say that, pardon me, I would also say that um, when it comes to the Hatch-Waxman type of cases, that's where we see, uh, I consistently see really, you know, elaborate opinions from district courts with, with a lot of fact findings. I mean, that, that seems uh, unusually intense, the, the degree of um, exploration that you see in a district court opinion. Um, and then we have our Rule 12 motions, and those are the one-on-ones. And there you see uh, probably a lot more variance. Right? You see the, the three-page opinions and you see the 30-page opinions. No, there, there's no real way to summarize that. So practically speaking then, um, you know, for practitioners who are presenting um, IPR appeals to the federal circuit, is there anything that uh, we can do to improve the presentation um, through briefing or oral argument or any, anything to make the IPR appeals um, you know, better for the court? Um, you know, th this may, I don't know, I'm not trying to be funny, but you should really win below because it's, it's hard to, to flip one of these decisions because they tend to be fact-bound decisions. And, and, you know, as an appellate court, we, we really have, we're, we're bounded by a lot of different principles. And one is um, standards of review. And we give, a, we give a good amount of deference to uh, the patent board or district court or juries when it comes to the fact findings that they make. So we're, we're not inclined to overturn those unless there is a very clear mistake on that order. Um, and, and also, unfortunately, we see people, lawyers, um, finally figuring out the best theory of their case once they arrive at the federal circuit. And now they're making some very interesting arguments um, after they've concentrated their mind and gone through the entire experience of the patent board proceeding of, of what are some really strong arguments, but they didn't raise them below. And so then it's very hard to ask us to reverse the patent board for some argument that the patent board never confronted because you never raised it to them. 
So, it, you know, these are obvious things, but at the same time, these things occur enough times in terms of the kinds of arguments we see that um, I, I think it's worth uh, reminding people. And then of course, another thing to remember is not only do you have to be very, very clear about your technology, but you also have to remember that again, we're an appellate court, we're not the patent board. And so you don't use the same degree of detail in describing all of the facts as you would with the patent board tribunal, given that we're now at the appellate stage. And we're really more inclined to find legal error than fact-bound error. Sure. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So we keep talking about, you know, how many IPR appeals the court has now, but the, the idea of having a significant number of appeals from administrative agencies is not something particularly new to the federal circuit. The court hears appeals from a variety of other federal agencies. Um, how do these IPR appeals differ from the appeals from other administrative agencies that the court hears, or are there any similarities? Yeah, um, I see a lot of similarities. Um, it, it, you know, like you were suggesting, we at this court, we do a lot of admin law. We see um, appeals from, that come from the Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Commerce, Merit Systems Protection Board, which is about civil service protections for federal employees. Um, so uh, government contract disputes from defense department. And so we have to know the, those government procurement regulations pretty well. So you get used to principles of statutory interpretation, regulatory interpretation, uh, the Chenery Doctrine, Chevron, uh, due process, um, all of those cut across all of these different proceedings. And then uh, there's in all these proceedings, agency hearings where uh, there's witness testimony and credibility determinations and admissibility of evidence. Um, so there's a, there's a lot to connect uh, among the different types of cases we see. And so it, it makes sense, I would think, for a patent lawyer to be familiar with those other areas of federal circuit law because the federal circuit judges are seeing those areas of law too and are often thinking about how to apply these more general administrative law principles in a consistent manner across all these different areas of law. That's a great point. And you know, if I ran my numbers correctly, I, I think when you add up all of the administrative agency appeals from the various uh, entities that the Federal Circuit currently has, I believe there's about 750 administrative agency appeals pending at the court, um, which, which is just incredible. Um, and that's actually about the same number of administrative agency appeals that the DC Circuit is currently handling. So you know, is this something that, you know, obviously patent practitioners should be familiar with administrative law, but should attorneys that practice in the administrative law area also be looking to the federal circuit for, you know, guidance and interpretation on those various doctrines, for example, Chinnery and Chevron uh, that, you've, that you've mentioned? Yeah, I, I would think so. I, I mean, today, to be someone that is working in patent board proceedings and then appeals from patent board proceedings to the federal circuit. I think you have to be great at patent law. You also have to be great at admin law. I mean, you, you need to think of yourself as an administrative law expert as well. And so that means it is worth consulting DC circuit law because they do so much admin law. And, um, you know, I can imagine that lawyers that are working over the DC circuit, you know, they not only does the DC circuit have a very well-developed body of law, but then there's this uh, sister circuit in town, of us, the federal circuit, that's also generating uh, our share of it, uh, opinions that are admin law based. Absolutely. 
Well, before I know we're um, running out of time here together, so um, I want to turn just to a minute to a couple questions uh, specifically geared toward our students here in the audience today. So let's just, you know, have a general question here of, you know, are, what kind of advice would you give to our law students um, as they consider their future careers in patent law? Okay. Um, let's see here. I guess one piece of advice, if you're third year student, maybe it's too late to give you this advice, but um, if you're a first or second year, the thing I would say is, um, don't be afraid to try new things. Um, you know, it's uncomfortable, it's a little bit scary. Maybe you don't know if you should try to do moot court because you're not comfortable speaking in front of people. Maybe you don't wanna do that clinic or you don't wanna take that appellate advocacy class or you don't wanna take admin law because it's hard. And my advice to you is as you go out into the real world and you're, you're going to be a young lawyer, you're going to be regularly doing things that you've never done before. And, and so it's actually helpful, I think, while you're in law school to start trying things out that make you uncomfortable and then stretch yourself. And then you see, oh, you are able to do this. And so you, you're already on your way of getting used to and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable and trying new things. And, and, and in doing so, I think this, this is what happened to me, not in law school, but after law school, um, you gain more self-confidence yourself. And you think, okay, I might be younger than a lot of the other lawyers in the room, but uh, I have my own abilities and I've already stress tested myself in a few ways and this might be a new situation for me, but I'm pretty sure I can get through it just like I got through those other situations uh, while I was in law school. So that's what I would do. I would think of law school like a laboratory for your mind where you're just experimenting with different things, trying new things out. And, and, and so therefore don't be afraid and don't be hesitant to jump right in and, and, and stretch and exercise your mind and develop that mind muscle is is what I would say. I think that's great advice. So hopefully all of our law students listening will, will follow that advice um, as they continue throughout law school. Um, let's wrap up with just a couple questions that have come in from our audience. Um, so <clears throat> one question um, is kind of a two-part question. Um, how does it feel, Judge Chen, to be one of the newest judges after nearly a decade on the court? And what is the impact, good or bad, of not having any new appointees to the court for about five years? Yeah, um, I would say for the first couple of years here, I did not feel comfortable here because um, I was still relatively young. I, uh, I was in my forties when I joined the court and I literally grew up in this career um, appearing in front of these judges. Uh, I was in the solicitor's office for 15 years. So I don't, and then I was a technical assistant on staff here at the Federal Circuit before that. So I'd always looked to these judges like they were the golden gods of patent law. And now um, they wanted me to think of them as a co equal. And actually, psychologically, that was really hard for the first year or two. And I did not want to call Judge Lori Allen. I did not want to call Judge Newman Polly. That made me sick to my stomach to even think about doing that. So it was an adjustment uh, for sure to no longer um, look at them as above me and try to figure out a way to uh, be comfortable at um, be comfortable with seeing them see me as a co-equal of them. So that, that took a little bit of time, but now I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much over it. If I'm gonna <laughs> disagree with them, I disagree with them. And as for the stability of the court, uh, I, I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. Um, I personally really like everybody here at the court and the current composition of the court. And so for me, if the court stayed like this for another decade, uh, that would be fine by me. So, um, 
I'm not really hunting to get any new members of the court, nor am I hunting to see anybody leave the court, if that answers the question. Sure, sure. And we'll just take one last question that's come in. So you touched a bit on this earlier, but is there anything you see occasionally from advocates in briefing or oral, oral argument that you would particularly encourage or discourage? Um, okay, discourage first, that's easy. Don't mischaracterize the record or the precedent. Um, we will find you. And then when we find you, we'll be very disappointed. And then when we're disappointed, it can't help but affect how we think about you. And hopefully it doesn't affect how much we think about your client's case, but it definitely affects how we think about you. And I can't help it. I have a long memory. And so you don't need to do that to yourself. So uh, rule number one, don't debase yourself with your briefs or your oral argumentation in front of us. Uh, things that are great to do, you know, uh, sometimes it's, I think it's worth being creative with your legal research to the extent that you can consider other bodies of law that are related and, and may then say, well, we can, analogize uh, some of those principles over there. You know, for, I mean, I don't know if it would work, but in copyright law, uh, they have a dichotomy between idea and expression. And I always wondered to myself, is that idea expression dichotomy relevant at all to how we should think about the abstract idea exception and whether something is a merely an abstract idea or a practical application of an abstract idea. Um, you know, researching the history of a statue. You know, there's, there's different things that you can do to present your case that go beyond merely uh, citing three or four of the most popular cases that stand for a particular principle and then, and then argue about why the facts of your case are just like that. So, uh, analogies can be helpful. Um, you know, we, we over here, we have so many different cases we have to prepare for in a given court week. And so we have to compartmentalize in our minds, you know, 15, 16 different cases to the, to the best you can, if you can distill your case down to some pithy, catchy analogy that helps me, uh, remember your case and and if you frame it right, you might actually help yourself um, induce me to think about the case in a way that's favorable to you. Wow, well, I think those are great pieces of advice uh, for all the practitioners that we have here today. Um, so unless you have any final words, Judge Chen, um, we just wanna say thank you so much uh, for taking the time to be with us uh, today. I know court week's coming up, you have a lot going on. Um, but I, it has been an absolute pleasure um, to chat with you this morning, and I'm sure everyone in our audience um, has really benefited from uh, this discussion. So thank, thank you so much. Thank you, Angela. The pleasure is all mine. It's great to see you again. And uh, I know there's a lot of great things going on down at uh, SMU Law School with this particular side center of innovation. And uh, I haven't gotten down there yet, but I'm sure one day I will. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much again, Judge. We appreciate it. Okay, take care. So thank you very much, Angela, and, and thank you, Judge Chen, for, for joining us. Uh, we're now going to take a 15-minute a break, and then we will, uh, well, a little less than 15 minutes, we'll reconvene at 11.15 for our symposium keynote.